Please turn with me in your Bibles again. The book of Hebrews, chapter 13. Hebrews 13. <clears throat> Moving forward. Read verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers. For by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained, chained with them. Those who are mistreated since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear what can man do to me. Theology shapes every aspect of life. <laughs> Whether you are clearly able to discern that or articulate that or not, theology really does shape every aspect of your life in some way or another. One of the most profound ways that theology influences us is indeed in our relationships. The law tells us to love the Lord God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, with all of us. The law tells us to love him supremely. And then to love our neighbor as ourself. And I think a, a good reasonable description could be made that one probably can't love their neighbor as themselves unless they love the Lord first. One can't really love humanity unless they really love and understand the Creator. So there you are. You're starting off from the beginning with a sense of theology, a knowledge of God, a study of God, a science of God. Christ's gospel teaches us to love fellow Christians as we love family and to relate to one another as we would brothers and sisters, to see each other as bonded together in one body, to see each other as having the same eternal purpose and the same eternal home. Christianity takes the law of love your neighbor as yourself and view people as image bearers and view people as sacred and as... Um, and as special unto God, it takes that and says, see, see your fellow believers as family. Of course there's theology involved. Chapter 12 tells us of our home together. Chapter 12 tells us of our, of our future together. We just read about a kingdom that can never be shaken. We just read about how in that kingdom that can never be shaken, in that heavenly Jerusalem, in that eternal home, we are all with the justified saints. We are all together in fullness. We read this morning in Sunday school about the heavenly Jerusalem which adorns herself as a bride for Christ. That Jerusalem, that temple, that's you and me. We're all part of that. So with that theology in mind, we better have a, a nice application of that in our lives. Some people, when they oversimplify the law of God or oversimplify the commands of Scripture, they put them down into the, the thou shalt nots and the thou shalts, or the do's and the don'ts. Some people have an easier time with the, the don'ts, and the do's are harder. This text, this chapter, starts out with the do's, but it doesn't leave you without a reason for it. The reason was everything we've just read. Now, essentially, the writer of Hebrews is saying, now, because you understand these theological truths, this great reality of your God, 
Now, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Now, put that theology into practice. And now, let it be in your words, in your attitude, in your sentiment. May these deep truths enable you to view the visible saints as they're meant to be viewed. And may they, these deep truths, enable you to distinguish how to work that out in business, in life, in family, so that there's nothing that gets in the way of your love for God and then your love for each other. If Christ is both, if, if Christ is all and Christ is first, in everyone's heart. And imagine how that changes the relationship to begin with. Imagine how you relate to someone if you both love the Lord before you love anything else. See, God sets out that as the ideal. He says, look, here in this falling world, you're always going to trip over yourself. But if you keep moving towards that ideal, me, if you keep moving towards a love of Christ, these relationships, these ways of dealing with one another will indeed become easier. We are to have a Christian affection that is fueled by our affection and understanding of God. When Esther used to teach preschool, she used to come home with uh, quite a few entertaining stories, a lot of tragic stories. And one of the stories that has always stuck with me was uh, a new student came, father walk the child into the classroom, and we're talking a three-year-old here. Father walked the child into a classroom, he was very stern. He kneeled down and he said, you see all these other children? They are all your enemy. True story. And that was reflected in the child's attitude, the parent's attitude, as this went on. It's hard for us to, re to realize this, but that's how many, many, many view everyone they encounter as some form of enemy. And let's be realistic. If human history has taught us anything, it's that people can be awful to one another. It is very hard to trust somebody. I, uh, talking about the, the war that's going on right now, it is a reminder again about how much effort and creativity we have put into being able to destroy other people. The weapons we've created, the tactics we've dreamed up, how much we've been able to put into destroying other people. So when a child is told that everyone in their classroom is their enemy, let's remember that that's the theology of the world. That's the natural theology that comes from evolution. I was reading an article to this past week, very, very interesting. People who, want to, people who want to combine evolution with Christianity and with God. And, and we use the term God, God enabled and caused evolution. And their, their whole concept of, is that evolution is all working towards this, this amorphous unity of a new creation uh, where there is no distinction between, between genders, between cultures, between anything along those lines. But they still want to believe that Christ died for sin. It just doesn't work together. The theology of the world and the theology of evolution is death. The theology of evolution is, I'm better than you, I get to do what I want with you. The theology of evolution is a theology of slavery. It's a theology of exploitation. And it's a theology of hatred. It is not the theology of Christ and of his gospel. When someone is tainted early on, that everyone around them is their enemy, of course it's going to have a negative effect on how you grow up and how you view people and how you interact with people. We've all had bad experiences with people. But those bad experiences for the Christian must be brought under the banner of Christ being able to forgive and overcome, and Christ being the one who can wipe away the evil, and Christ being the one who will deal with the consequences. Our challenge when we deal with people 
is to, and especially and when our challenge when we deal with Christians, is to see the Lord as much as possible. We say all the time that theologically, Christ justifies us in that when God, the Godhead, looks at us, He sees the Son because we've been covered by the Son. Well, for all of us in Christ. I think there is some application of that, that when we see a brother and sister in the Lord, we ought to see Christ more than their imperfections as well. We ought to see that first because that will enable us to love them. And that will not enable us to focus on quirks or annoyances or things that get in our way, but to see the Lord who bought them and purchased them and loves them more than we can comprehend. That's Christian affection. And when he says, let brotherly love continue, this is what has, this is the theology that has to shape that. Let brotherly love continue, and don't forget to entertain strangers. Now, he's not leaving context here. He's talking about Christian strangers. Everything that is being dealt with here is being dealt with those who are really within the bonds of Christ's body. Don't be afraid to entertain strangers. Think of the context of the world. People traveling from city to city, people preaching the gospel, sharing the good news, going about their business, people engaged in trade, but brothers and sisters recognizing that their first identity was in Christ, now encountering other brothers and sisters. You may not know this person, but this person in a world where it is not cool to call yourself a Christian, is saying, I am a Christian, hello. By the way, I've got no place to sleep tonight. Don't be afraid to take that person in and take it on trust that you're doing the right thing. Our world has changed the very dynamic of hospitality. We, we think of hospitality as just being nice to a friend and having them over for dinner. That's not hospitality. That's not what the word means. Hospitality means taking in someone you do not know who has no other means of getting those provisions. That's biblical hospitality. That was the term when it was used in the New Testament. When he says to overseers of the church, be hospitable, he means when there is someone who has no other resource and they need your home and your food, make sure you shelter them and feed them. It is what the Good Samaritan does. The man is lying in a ditch, and he is hospitable by bringing him to an inn. <laughs> That's hospitality. Hospitality is not, hey, let's hang out together. And so when he says, "Be, uh, don't forget to entertain strangers, That's, he's talking about real Christian hospitality. He is saying that we are to think about these people as brothers and sisters, even if we do not know them. If their testimony is the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they need you, do it. Now, in our world, because how we've built up so much, hospitality may be putting someone up into a hotel. Hospitality may be buying them a grocery store gift card. But it is the heart of it that matters. It is how you view that person, how you relate to that person. Are they your enemy? Or are they a brother or sister? He says, by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. This is an interesting verse. It's an interesting concept. Our first, our first interpretation is, is to take it very concretely, and it's very possibly taken that way. That is, that the spiritual beings that we know very little about sometimes mask themselves as human beings on mission from God and taking in a stranger, you may very well be taking in someone who is a, a, a direct servant of God. And so your theology influences how you see people. You may be taking in someone who is on direct mission from God. That's the, that's the literal, concrete way to take it, that many people read this. But if you broaden it out a little, remember what an angel is. An angel is a messenger, right? So what he's saying is if you take in a stranger on good faith, they are a Christian, 
you may very well be taking in someone who has a great calling from God. And by feeding them, clothing them, giving them a place to sleep, you are advancing the spread of God's kingdom. To me, in context, that probably fits a little more neatly. In other words, entertaining a stranger is not just taking in a random guy. Entertaining a Christian stranger advances the kingdom of God. And so, theology shapes relationships. Bear that in mind, brothers and sisters, for that's what we're being taught here. He also says, remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated since you yourselves are in the body also. Now, I've heard this also misused. Remember the prisoners? Of course, we are to have general sympathy with anybody in a, a miserable situation. But the context is remember those who are chained and imprisoned for the faith. Remember those who are prisoners in fellowship. That's what he's calling them to do. Remember those who are suffering for the truth. If you know someone who is imprisoned for their faith, that's a significant, a significant punishment that every Christian should sympathize with. And so it, we're asked to pray for them. We're asked to do what we can for them. We're asked to comfort them, to visit them. Christians were there for Christ, not because they robbed, not because they murdered. They were there because they would not worship the emperor above Christ. Their love of God and a love of the brethren means that you are called to be a light and an encouragement when that person suffering is in need. If you read Paul's prison epistles, you get a sense of how thankful he is for those who remembered him in prison, for those who visited him in prison. There's a famous verse where he says, "Be, make sure you come before winter. Think of winter in a cold, wet pit come before that happens because you will be of great service and encouragement to me in prison encouragement by others encouragement to others is a great task that the Christian undertakes because of right theology a lot of times Christians think they have to do great things for God you realize that just an opportunity to bring encouragement is something that is recorded and put down be a crown of life and glory. Encouragement is a wonderful thing. Encouragement is a great ministry. And if you are someone who builds up rather than tears down, then you are on the mission of God. I, uh, I'm often very, uh, I often have to teach myself and remind myself about the careful use of humor. Um, Sarcasm is very funny at times, but sarcasm as a word means to tear at flesh. Because sarcasm is really supposed to be used as an attack. If you're just a sarcastic person who tears at people with humor, check yourself. Because you want to be able to use your humor as an encouragement, not as a mockery to tear someone down. You want to be someone who brings the light and life of your Lord, who nourishes and feeds, not destroys and dismantles. Your, your convictions could very well put you in the situation of someone in prison. What would you want in that situation? How would you want to be treated? And what do you look for from others? We all want to be built up and nourished. Brotherly affection and brotherly love is not to be manufactured or forced. That's another thing that sometimes bothers me about people who, who read Scripture and then say, I have to do this. And then they do it without a real love for the Lord. And like in 1 Corinthians 13, it's a clanging gong and noisy, noisy symbol. Brotherly affection is not to be manufactured. It really does have to have a motivation. It really does have to have a right view. It's better to not do something than to do it under false pretenses or to do it just by force. The love of God is, of course, your fuel, as we already said. 
But one of the things that helps with that fuel is, of course, doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Putting yourself in other people's circumstances is a powerful teaching from the Lord that creates sympathy, that creates warmth, that creates uh, activity for someone. And it's vital to your relationships with not only Christians, but everybody. It is amazing how easy it is to look at another person and condemn them without knowing anything about them. It is amazing how much we throw out judgment calls without trying to get in someone's shoes. It's amazing how do unto others as, they would have, as you would have them do unto you is so easily said and so little practiced in our world. It is so easy for the attitude to be, I got mine. Sorry, buddy. No, I think we are all called, cool. even in circumstances of disagreement, to consider the other person's thought process and opinion. It is important sometimes, even in understanding a sinner, to think where are they coming from and why are they doing what they're doing. Of course the Bible teaches why ultimately. Of course the Bible teaches the, the, the darkened heart, the hardened heart. But where does the reasoning come from? What is the motivation behind that? You understand that. You will understand your own darkness. And then you'll understand all the more how powerful and important it is that the truth of God and the glory of Christ be absorbed and be taken in. Of course, people don't like this. Think about how boring talking head shows would be if everybody just put themselves in their opponent's shoes. Think about how boring debates would be if we all just, I sympathize with you, I really do. No, people like the viciousness. Why? Because our theology is the theology of the world, unfortunately. We are called to the theology of Christ. We are called to recognize what situation others are in. We are called to apply that with everyone we meet whether it's a server at a restaurant or a clerk in an office or someone who works under you or someone you work for, before we snap to judgment, let's consider what God's affection is for us, first in the church, but then also as we're able with everyone we encounter. He takes the relationship aspect of God's people from abroad relationship because of theology and narrows it now in chapter 4. There is a, a narrower relationship that God has ordained and that God has set into motion amongst believers that also is to be commended and also is to be fueled by theology and also is to be understood through the unity of God with his people. He says, marriage is honorable among all. And within the bond of fellowship, a union between a man and a woman who commit themselves to each other before God and before the church and their community, making the statement and broadcasting that, vowing to each other and God, that is an honorable union. That is an honorable relationship. And if any relationship has to be fueled by theology, it better be that one. Because this is something that has also been instituted by God. This is something that has also been put together by the divine creator and author of all things. This is something that also, in, in even more of a way, in, in, in a great way, is symbolic of the theology that Christ has taught us about himself and about the people that he has saved. We're told that man and a woman leave their father and, them, and their mother and they become one flesh. They cleave to one another. You leave your first home. You leave your first estate. You leave your first allegiance. You leave your, your, your first alliance and now you form a new alliance. You form a new allegiance. You form a first, a new estate together. Just as the person who was born again leaves what they were and is now bonded to Christ. It is 
picturesque of that. God, in the originator of, of relationships, because he has them in and of himself in the Trinity, he relates between himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is only because we serve, there is a Trinitarian God that there are concepts such as love. It is only because there is a Trinitarian God that relationship can be understood by his creation. Because God is the originator of relationship, he then branches out that relationship and then, and then clarifies that relationship even more with the giving of the Son and the sacrifice of the Son for his church. And he says, with marriage, there is to be an understanding of giving of yourself for each other and loving the other as Christ loved the church and gave itself, himself for it. And then to honor and obey and, and to cherish and to love back the one who gave all for you. Now, not everyone is going to be married on earth. Not everyone is going to enter into this relationship. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Not everyone is going to, to, to be gifted this. But everyone will need to understand communion with God. Not everyone is going to understand communion with a spouse. But everyone needs to understand communion with God. And communion with God can be known even for the single person. It can be known, of course, even for the person who is widowed or separated. Communion with God must be the overarching understanding in any relationship, particularly in marriage. Within the holy relationship of marriage and within the honorable bond of, of marriage, there is a sexual intimacy. He says the bed is undefiled. And that sexual intimacy is a good thing. Don't buy into a lot of Gnostic theology that has been brought into Christianity through the centuries, particularly early on in Christian history, where the body is evil and anything that is evil and anything that is of the body is evil and wicked. I think that sexuality in itself is sin. God created it. God created it to be very good. God formed man and woman to do this together. Sexual intimacy is a glorious thing. When he says the bed is undefiled, when people have committed themselves to one another, what they do together, there are no, there are no inhibitions there. There is no shame there. Between the two people in holy union, they are to love one another. The unbeliever does not know God. The unbeliever has their theology out of whack. And the unbeliever shares no real relationship with God. And therefore, the unbeliever is always going to miss out on the full intimacy, not only of marriage, but of sexuality. The Christian in Christ is bonded to him. And when man and woman come together, they share a hint of the joy and pleasure of eternal bliss. There is a reason why the Old Testament uses the term adultery when it comes to false worship. There is a reason why the Old Testament often uses sexual words when it comes to idolatry. Because what man and woman do together has a worshipful intimacy to it and has a worshipful experience to it. Bonding of people for the glory of God, enjoyment and wonder. And when somebody destroys that or abuses that or dismantles that or simplifies that or makes that common or profane, they are essentially taking what God has created and what God has set up as some, as, as, as his future, as his new creation, and say, yeah, no, I'm going to play with that as a toy. That is why fornication and adultery are such serious sins. Don't, I, I know it goes on all over the world. 
I know it's in every movie. I know it's on every show. I know it's in every book. I know it's, it's become so commonplace that to think that, that fornication and adultery are bad things have become warped in our minds. But let's remember that the Christian is not against these things because the Christian is just a stick in the mud or doesn't know how to have fun or doesn't know how to express themselves or doesn't know how to be open with somebody else. That's not it at all. The Christian is against these things because the Christian first and foremost loves God and loves God what God has created. And fornication and adultery are serious sins that will not be tolerated, that God does judge because it takes what is sacred and holy and set apart and honorable and spits all over it. Spiritual adultery. The body of Christ, it, the body of Christ becomes involved when the Christian is involved in such a thing. Paul has a very graphic uh, description of what is actually going on when a Christian engages in sexual immorality in 1 Corinthians 6. You can read about it in 1 Corinthians 6. He actually uses a very graphic image. But the body of Christ is involved, the Holy Spirit is involved. And when sin is not repented of, and sin is not brought to Christ, and sin is not covered by the blood, it'll be judged. And if the person involved in that sin is marked by that sin, we read in Revelation this morning, and have not, has not come to Christ and has not overcome in Him, they'll be branded with that sin. And they'll be branded, as even this passage says, as, an, as a fornicator and adulterer if they are not a Christian first. And God will judge that. So when we see the world consumed, consumed with the, the casual toying playfulness of sexuality, something that is sacred and intimate and holy. We see the world consumed with that. Let's not snicker. Let's not shrug our shoulders. Let's recognize what actually is going on there and who created that and, and why. The anchor and rock through all this, through all relationship, through all understanding, the anchor and rock through all this ocean, storm-tossed relationship ocean, is a knowledge and a love of God. I believe very firmly that relationships go sour when God is not first. I believe very firmly that when a person thinks of themselves first, the relationship is already on the rocks, floundering. If you know Him first, love Him first, then you also know Him as provider and as ultimate power who guides us against covetousness. Covetousness naturally means we go first. We want. I see, I want. I see, I want. Of course, there's covetousness in, in sexual immorality, but there's covetousness in so many other things. And covetousness means that God is not your provision, and God is not your power. We are told to trust and love the ultimate source. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Covetousness is a craving for what you have not been given. Covetousness is an obsession with things that God has not granted you. Covetousness means that you cannot, cannot accept where you are and who you are. But it doesn't mean, uh, to be content with such things as you have does not mean stagnation. We move forward by faith. We move forward in the provision of God. We move forward with the blessing and leading of God. We do not move forward by our own lust and by our own greed and by our own hunger and by our own cravings and by our own desires. We are to recognize what has been given and to trust and love the source. God is the provider, and growth and advancement will come in God's way, in God's time, with all humility and with all patience. Part of our sanctification is to work this out and to come to terms of peace with it. 
Part of our sanctification is to recognize the humility, you know, the need for humility and the need for patience. Part of sanctification is to look at what is around us and say, I don't deserve that. Not what every commercial teaches us that we do deserve. You deserve it. You deserve it. No, you don't. When you say, I don't deserve it, contentment will follow. God is able to give anything when he wants to. When we remember that, it will really help with our covetousness. Is that mine? No. Is there a chance I can get it with God's blessing under God's way and God's provision and God's timing? With God's trust and God's obedience? No, there isn't. Good, then I don't need it. Does God say I can have that? No. He says no. That's sin. Well, good, I don't need it. We trust him as provider and source and recognize he is able to give us anything at any time. And then we recognize that we have all in him already. Then our, con our conduct will be without covetousness and contentment. He says, that I will never leave you or forsake you. This goes hand in hand with everything he's just said. It is the unbreakable absolute of God. It is the unbreakable reality of his covenant of grace. That ultimate relationship is found in him. Ultimate joy, ultimate pleasure, ultimate intimacy, ultimate glory is found in him. Ultimate presence. Everyone and every power that you need is with you when you walk and live in Christ ultimate benefit is found in him. I remember for years, even after I was a Christian, reading about God saying, don't worry about what you eat or what you wear, but be like the lilies of the field. For years as a Christian, I looked at that and thought, that's, that's, that's extreme. I have to worry about what I eat. I have to worry about what comes. I have to worry about tomorrow. He says, no. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. Now, is he just, is he, is he kidding? No, he's not kidding. He's saying, trust me. I am your all, and I am your unbreakable strength and confidence. And when I am your all, then you can plan, but you don't have to worry. You don't have to fear. I will be with you. And I care for the sparrows, and I care for the lilies. And you need to rely on me. Because I will never leave you. Never forsake you. Now that, if that is not your unbreakable absolute, you're in trouble. That unbreakable absolute will affect your relationship with God and your relationship with people. And that unbreakable absolute will enable you to say, I won't fear what humanity can do to me. I won't fear what will come because the greatest power in the universe is on my side because I'm on his side. The greatest power in the universe is with me and the greatest power in the universe has died for me. The greatest power in the universe will comfort me and hold me and the greatest power of the universe has already ordained my future and my heavenly eternal home with him. Don't mistake bravery and faith for apathy and coldness. Sometimes people think a confident Christian is something of a distant Christian or something of a cold Christian. We don't mean to be cold. We don't mean to be distant. We just have our confidence in the right source. I want you to have your confidence in that source as well. We have our confidence in such an unshakable truth that it's sometimes hard for us to display the shaken emotion you want us to show. Sympathy is real, and sympathy should be applied, but sympathy is not panic. We ask ourselves, what could possibly happen if the worst thing that can happen to you is death, and you remember in Christ that's the greatest home going you know. We look at, we look at a situation like Ukraine, I will not fear what man can do to me. 
Well, it's pretty horrible what man is doing over there. What if you were in a situation like that? Would you trust? Would you move on? Would you live? Would you do what needs to be done? Would you take every moment as given to you by God, trusting Him for every purpose, every moment, every morsel? Consider Christ and consider heaven. And when you consider that and your theology is in the right place, your relationship with all of life will follow. Again, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added unto you. The message of the gospel is very repetitive. And this message teaches us, challenges us, and hits us in a way that we really need to grow from. We have union with God. Because of that, we have union with people. We have a kingdom that is unshakable, and we have good news that makes every day for us good news in Him. All glory be to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that your truth influences everything we do and everyone we interact with. May brotherly love continue. May, I, may our care for those in need be real. May our appreciation of what relationship is uh, be total. And may our confidence in you be absolute. Bless us in these things. Cause us to grow in these things. And cause our love for you to abound in fullness. We ask it in Christ's precious name.